everyone, it's evolution in five minutes or less. So stick with me and let's see if we can get this done. So the idea is that all living things share a common ancestor. So how do we know this? Well, we know this from the fossil record. That is where we look at structural similarities in the bones and everything that we find deep within the rocks, within the earth that are thousands, even millions of years old. We also know this from biogeography. Where do we find these fossils? Where are they located? Are they located at the same latitudes, different elevations? What similarities can we determine from where different organisms live? Also, we look at three different homologies, anatomical, molecular, and developmental. Let's look at anatomical homologies a little bit more closely. Homologous structures like the ones we see here, this is where the parts are the same, but the function is different. Human, cat, whale, and bat forelimbs have very, very similar structures, but the functions are very different. Obviously, maybe to grab things, to walk, to swim, or to fly even. This is a great example of divergent evolution, where at some point a common ancestor, yes, uh, diverged and created different functions for the same parts, as you can see here. Now, on the other side of the coin, we've got analogous structures where you have Look, three different types of wings. The parts all look very different, but the function is the same. Great example of convergent evolution where different organisms evolved uh, structures to do the same function, in this case, flight. This is actually not an example of a common ancestor like homologous structures are. The other structures that we're gonna look at are vestigial structures. These are leftover structures that once served a purpose, but no longer do so, like the tailbone, appendix, or even wisdom teeth in human beings. Now, natural selection. This is the big one. This is the driving force of evolution. And the big point that you need to understand is individuals do not evolve. Populations evolve over time through natural selection. So natural selection needs a few things in order to happen. It needs genetic variation. So genetic variation is just which alleles there are in the gene pool. And we call this the allele frequency, the dominant and recessive alleles that are within a population there. So how can we change the allele frequency or how does it change over time to show that natural selection has occurred? Well, a couple of ways. We've got gene flow. This is just when normal migration happens between populations of the same species. Very, very normal that happens. Another thing that can happen is something called genetic drift. These are accidental or catastrophic occurrences that destroy portions of a population and therefore those individuals cannot survive to reproduce and you get some selection for different traits totally by accident. So natural selection also needs adaptations like the butterflies that mimic a poisonous butterfly or the moths that are camouflaged uh, and you cannot uh, see them at all. Therefore, predators cannot see them and they survive longer to reproduce. Those are adaptations. What are the other things that natural selection needs? Lots of offspring need to be produced and there needs to be a differential in survival. So you need to have different traits, some of which get chosen for and some of which do not get chosen for. And therefore, those individuals do not survive to reproduce. So how does natural selection work with traits controlled by more than one gene? Well, we look at a couple of different types of selection here, actually a few. Uh, we have maybe these beetles. There's five different colors of them. A normal bell curve would show a distribution uh, with few on the extreme and a lot in the middle. Directional selection is maybe if one extreme gets chosen for or the other and the bell curve gets shifted. The one in the middle here called disruptive selection is when the one in the middle, the mean, does not get chosen for and the extremes are chosen for, for some reason, some environmental pressure. And then the last one, stabilizing selection, is when that bell curve gets really, really skinny and it's just the middle color that gets chosen for and the extremes are left out. So look at cladograms here. This is a, a type of chart that you'll need to be very familiar with. This shows different organisms and their different derived characters, so different characteristics that they may share. Now, the more derived characters that organisms share, the more closely related they are and the more close uh, their common ancestor was. So now that we know where everything came from, we need to classify it all. So we need to look at taxonomic groups, domain all the way through species. These are the taxonomic groups. Domain is the most uh, broad or least specific. And species there at the bottom is the most specific. One way you can remember the domain kingdom phylum and all this is dumb kids playing cars on freeways get smashed. Think about that. 
Uh, where do the scientific names come from? The binomial nomenclature? Well, Homo sapiens, that's our genus and our species. That's how you do the scientific name, genus and species. And that was evolution in five minutes or less, I hope.